Good evening, everyone. We are going to start the panel discussion. The panel discussion on topic Education 2.0, the tech transformation journey. How te technology is shaping the future education. Before starting the panel discussion, let me give you an introduction about the topic. So here we are going to talk or discuss about the modernization and the transformation of traditional education practices through integration of technology, innovative pedagogy, and student-centered approach. So when you're looking to the different types of pedagogies or the educational pedagogies, the traditional pedagogy is heavily focusing on standardized testing and the lecturing method. But currently, when you are incorporating the new pedagogies or new technological uh, innovation, it emphasizes more on personalized learning experience, collaborative learning environment, and also the use of digital tools to enhance the teaching and learning. So our discussion is mostly we are going to focus on the technological innovations and how the technology is shaping the future education. Let me introduce the panel members. We have the panel member, Mr. Indika De Sousa. He's highly experienced professional with a diverse background spanning over 30 years. Currently serve as a strategic advisor at Huawei Technology Lanka. Indika plays a pivotal role in the devising the strategic initiatives across all business units. His extensive career includes leadership role at Intel Corporation and ICT Agency of Sri Lanka. Indiga's involvement in various industry organizations and advisory boards demonstrated his commitment to shape Sri Lanka's digital landscape. Welcome to the panel, sir. Thank you. The next panel member, Mr. Hussein Naushad, is a versatile professional with a strong background in communications engineering and education. Currently serve as a senior engineer in the core network solutions at Diraco. He has gained extensive ICT expertise and passion for the industry. Naushad is also deeply involved in education, having acquired the Masters of Computer Science and actively engaged in teaching undergraduate and postgraduate students in the field. Additionally, he is an alumnus of Law College. He brings a unique perspective to the discussion on the inter intersection of technology and education. Welcome on board. The third panel member is Minha. Um, I, I think uh, uh, it's better for me to pronounce your name or call your name as Miku. That will be better for me. Okay. So Miku is a dynamic professional currently serves as a lead data scientist at TradeNet Maldives Corporate Limited. Uh, actually, it is very interesting to see a female data scientist in the field. Her professional journey has seen her contribution to local enterprise, esteemed international organizations like European Union, and UN agencies and the wide array of industries including banking, healthcare, agriculture, sports, automotive and aviation sector as well. Additionally, she is an associate member of Women's in Tech. Minha actively promotes diversity and inclusion in the tech industry. Um, welcome on board, Minha. The next panelist is Dr. Ibrahim Wahid. is a distinguished expert in educational technology and technology management over 15 years of experience in academia. And public administration. With the solid technology management and leadership, Dr. Wahid has contributed significantly to advancing educational technologies in higher education. His career includes over a decade of service in various leadership roles with government and private organization. Dr. Wahid was a senior vice rector at Cyrex College Maldives and assistant counselor and ICT head at Maldives Immigration. Dr. Wahid's expertise extends beyond academia and into practical implementation of technological solutions. He is the project manager for the Digital Maldives project funded by the World Bank. Dr. Wahid brings a wealth of experience and insight to the discussion on digital technology and its impact on higher education. Welcome on board, sir. So this is the broad introduction, a very brief introduction of all the panel members. So without wasting time, let me go inside the panel discussion. Okay. The first I want to ask to Mr. Indika De Sousa, as a leader in industry, how do you see the industry currently transforming education, particularly in the terms of preparing students for the rapidly changing the job market? 
Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that question. I think uh, the I touch upon a few things on my keynote as well. Uh, the key as organization, I will take the example of uh, Huawei itself rather trying to, exp I mean, easily explain. Uh, so Huawei as an organization, which is uh, our core uh, nuclear is that like, you know, research and development or the innovation what we create. So we have about 200,000 people. 50% of that, close to 100,000 people is on R&D. That's the strength what we bring in, 50% of them. And we are a company which is on the top three companies of spending, highest spending on R&D. We spent about roughly about 23 billion um, USD on R&D. So that's the strength we bring into the market. Now, we need as organization, as Huawei alone, we need 100,000 engineers, which is talking about the future technology. It's not about today's technology. We need to have that newer products, talking about 5G, etc. Why we are leading, that's the strength that we are bringing. Now, that's the DNA we are bringing to you all as an education institute. The MOU what we signed today, we bring that technology, the DNA what we have and tell you that this is the future generation should be shaping up. And this is the skill set what we need. That's all about this entire initiative is we are bringing it. Now, the key factor is like, you know, which is there are a lot of research talks about that in the future, the kid who's in undergrad or in school, when they come out to the job market, the job is not there. And also that the problem they're going to solve, the problem is not there. So you need to train the kid to solve a problem which not exist and to do a job that doesn't exist right now. So that's a big, steep challenge. Now, that is where we come in and say, hey, this is the trend line. This is what about intelligent world is all about. This is the technology is what is going to come in that intelligent world. We are talking about the, I mean, the point I said was sensing, connected, AI, etc. So now these are the tools, skills what you need to train. Then when the kid comes out of the market, there is a ready-made job. Now it's, when you look at a lot of, if you just do a Google search, Simply what the statement most of the CEOs make today. It can be Google to Apple to any of the organizations. They say what they are not looking for the college degree anymore. What they look for the skill. As long as you have the right skill, you will be hired. Now the key is you need to focus on. But if you look at all the big guys, you're talking from Bill Gates to Steve Jobs to all those. You know all of them are college dropouts. I'm not saying it should drop out of school. But the skill took them there. Yeah. So that's a difference. So that's the role as industry. I took the example of Huawei itself. It's easy to explain that how you bring it to make sure how do we shape the future generation coming in. Okay, thank you, sir. It's very interesting to listen. Um, the industry is looking for the skill, right? Yeah. And um, the right skill is the industry, if the institutions delivered, and that is what exactly the industry is looking for from the students. Thank you. So I will come back to you for the second round to explore more on this particular line. Thank you. Um, now I would like to ask Naushar, you are coming from academic side and also you are from the telecom sector as well, right? You are the engineer in the telecom sector. Could you share your insight on how technology is currently transforming education, especially considering the role of telecommunication in facilitating the access of resources across the country? Because that is something very important. When we talk about the transformation, the communication is very important. So how the telecommunications and how that helps in the industry and also the education field. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, I think uh, Education 2.0 in terms of practice in ICT in the education sector is uh, the primary aspect of the entire thing is communication connectivity so how the transformation is happening because of the connectivity the internet and also the resource availability at ease so whether it is considering um, any specific facility such as let's say engineering it uh, or any any type of business psychology law whatever the field that you are uh, studying or pursuing you know, or teaching for example the ICT industry has brought about this change, this transformation, helping providing them accessibility and providing more resources, providing more ways of engaging students, providing more way for entertaining students and providing personalized learning for a certain category of students. And so this has created an environment which will benefit everywhere, all the students, including the teachers. 
so that the, the way the students learn, the way the teachers teach, this has been transformed because of uh, internet, because of technology, and the whole industry is benefiting from it. Okay. Thank, thank you so much. Yeah. Um, thank you. I'll come back to the next round to you. Uh, Miho, you are the data scientist, right? So now currently in education field, the use of data is very important. It's not only in education, in all the fields, and you have experience in the business intelligence in the very different uh, areas as well. But in education also, the usage of data is very important. My question to you is, how do you see the technology currently transforming the education, particularly in terms of leveraging the data analytics and the machine learning, in terms of personalized learning, because that's very important to provide the personalized and the tailor-made learning to the students. How the data is used and how the technology is shaping in that direction. Thank you for the question. I believe that technology, with the advancement in technology, especially in data analytics, learning analytics and AI, uh, it's revolutionizing the education sector as a whole. Like teachers can use learning analytics and find out the strengths, the preferences of the students, and then they can tailor make the courses for these students. And also we can use machine learning algorithms to deliver the content depending on what the students are preferring. As we are moving towards online learning platforms, these things are these technological advancements are things that we can focus a lot on making uh, the studying journey very enjoyable for the students as well as for the teachers, they will learn a lot and get a lot of insights on what the students want from to be delivered in a course. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mika. Um, I, I want to ask Dr. Wahid, your expertise in education technology, so to please share the current impact on technology on education, and how do you see these advancements shaping the future of teaching and learning? So when she is talking about the personalized learning, probably the use of data and the use of uh, technology in education, it's exactly it's focusing on the learner centers teaching and also the online modality and different kind of um, hybrid modalities are coming in. So how do you see the future of education in terms of technological incorporation? Thank you. Um, yeah, yes. Thank you. Um, I think uh, uh, before I start, I'd like to have a question to the audience. Uh, uh, are we experiencing uh, Web 2.0 or 3.0? Like, I mean, the education. Because uh, this is uh, uh, education 1.0 is a metaphor from Web 1.0, and education 2.0 is a metaphor from Web 2.0. So right now we are experiencing. Yeah, right now we are experiencing uh, 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 the education 3.0 which is a metaphor of web 3.0. Uh, the, the education 1.0 basically experienced like, okay, it's uh, synchronous, uh, sorry, the um, uh, way of delivery, like is more lecturer-centered or instructor-centered delivery. And then it comes to interactive, more collaborative, uh, student-centered learning and teaching. And now we're experiencing like, it's not all about like interaction and collaboration, it's all about like even the learners are the content creators. So that's the future. So we are right now experiencing uh, education 3.4. So your question, yes, the first thing is it has opened many opportunities for the students as well as the instructors. Uh, in the context of motives, uh, you can now learn from anywhere, anytime. It's more flexibility for the students. And also that you can collaborate with the best instructors in the world which is I mean, more feasible uh, with the uh, education 2.0, 3.0. And uh, secondly, uh, the uh, customized, okay, okay, tailored made uh, teaching and learning, or what you call the uh, personalized instruction. So in the personal instruction now, there are platforms uh, we are A powered, which a prompted instructions, okay, and then with the help of that, the uh, learners or the students will be able to get the education based on their needs and the requirements. Very specific requirements can be catered using these platforms. So now, uh, uh, in, in the future, you'll see uh, the, the students can key in what they want to learn, 
okay? And there will be a pool of models in the system, and then the system will generate a tailor-made program for the student based on the requirements. That's how powerful actually. So with uh, Education 3.4, the personal learning becomes this advanced. And, and, and thirdly, uh, 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 it's uh, more uh, easy for uh, the, the, the students okay, who are physically okay, challenging to access uh, uh, different learning platforms and they can also access from anywhere uh, uh, these I mean, uh, uh, teaching and learning. So basically, uh, from the islands in the context of models, from islands from the cities, they are in one, they can access the data. Thank you. Um, so the artificial intelligence and the data analytics, or it's a prominent. It's going to take a prominent role in shaping the future education. Right. Um, so in that line, I just want to ask Miku. Um, your experience and in the data science and machine learning. So, considering the advancement in artificial intelligence and uh, learning analytics, how do you envision the leveraging these tools to promote the personalized learning? Um, because um, it's very important in the current trend, we need to understand what actu actually you need. Diverse thing the students need is very important, right? So, in terms of technology, in terms of available technology, especially in, uh, in artificial intelligence, what are the tools that we have and how we can practically incorporate those kind of tools into our teaching and learning process? Thank you for the question. Um, so, um, in, in right now we are experiencing a lot of, we, we can actually access a lot of AI powered platforms like um, Han Academy and Dreambox Learning. They use AI powered and um, powered bots within their system, and they also have machine learning algorithms embedded. So what happens here is the once mm, the student enters or registers into the uh, this kind of academies, they will provide with the AI powered content depending on your interest and your preferences. Uh, they will also be using your learning behaviors like you prefer learning in the night time, then they will send you notifications only at the night time so that you can work during the daytime. So there are a lot of other platforms like which the educators can use as well, like Blackboard and Canvas, uh, where you can actually uh, use the data and learn how the, how the behaviors and preferences keep changing for a student. Suppose somebody has a difficulty in learning uh, a maths concept. The system will, uh, the system will suggest practical problems and also alternative explanations un until until the student learns the concept. So these are very, these, these kind of things are very easy when you're a student. And also when you're a teacher, it helps you understand your, your students uh, better and then to give them the support that they need. And also, um, customized learning is very much, um, is quite, adopted in these kind of platforms like Coursera. They will ask you for your interest and what, what you want to learn at the moment, and then they will show you, and it will keep on popping up like, all oh, the AI is used within the system and it will introduce you to a new uh, course as soon as you finish, they will say this one, and uh, like there is another one and we will give you this much discount. So all these AI powered things are used uh, for personalized learning in today's world using the technology that has been uh, inbuilt. And this keeps on growing. As the world grows, there will be more new technologies using artificial intelligence and machine learning models. And the, all of these things depends on the research that has been taken. So I think in, even in Maldives, lots of students are being used, uh, using Coursera and Udemy courses are being used and also LinkedIn learning, um, depending on what kind of jobs that you have already been um, working on, that will suggest you new, uh, new courses for the next uh, couple of months that you can take. So I think these are, there's a lot of opportunities when it comes to technology and when it comes to embedding these new technologies within the education sector. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
So we um, let's let's switch from the um, data usage to the online learning. Uh, when you look into the uh, global education monitoring report, it says the users, the number of students in MOOC courses in 2012 to 2021, it's increased to 220 million. So we showed that the number of students who are using the MOOC kind of online courses, it's uh, dramatically it's increased. So that shows there is a radical change or radical change in the educational perspective. So I would like to ask Uzain Naushad about the online learning and what are the key opportunities in terms of educational transformation? What are the key opportunities do these advancements present for enhancing the teaching, especially focusing on students engagement, students collaboration and also providing the inclusive learning environment? Right. So I think I'll start with what Mimna was saying about use of artificial intelligence to provide personalized education because this is one area where it helps the student and also the institution. So, example, one of the examples is uh, uh, Microsoft EDU. For example, Microsoft EDU is one setup where you can integrate the uh, details of the institution, including the students' assignments and their participation in class for quizzes, as well as marks, their marks, including uh, other factors of the student which is stored in the university. So, the basic idea is for every student, there is a portfolio of information which can be interconnected and if those data is interconnected it reveals a lot of meaning a lot of information to focus on the student's specific capability or to find what is missing from this student why he is not able to achieve what he wants the same thing happens in google workspace you have the same type of setup so uh, the idea of students doing online learning is because it is available at ease now as you as we, she said for example Coursera or Udemy learning or LinkedIn learning they have all this platform where the students can self-learn so the self-learning is where you are looking for a skill set as um, uh, Indica said for example the industry is looking for skills so in order for you to build your own skills you need to learn yourself and a lot of online facilities is available for us to do self-learning, to develop your skills in, in, in a matter of few weeks, you can become expert in a specific language of programming, for example. And this is this is a good thing for students because it reduces the time that they need for uh, uh, the path for education. They don't have to attend a specific institution, stay there with a the teacher for a specific curriculum for X number of months or years in order to complete a specific skill. Uh, it, 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 this is not discouraging from the fact that still the teacher-centered education is ongoing. The idea of online systems and online collaborations are for uh, aiding, for assisting in the learning process. It doesn't really replace the entire traditional system of learning because there are some students who might benefit from a face-to-face -face interaction more than an online setup. You see, because the student doesn't have the capability to learn himself online. This is, this is one of the challenges some students might have. So it, it might be better for him to go for a traditional setup. So we, the idea of online, uh, online learning doesn't really mean replace the traditional learning. So the students have ease of achieving them. And plus, uh, uh, even for the institution, let's say for example here at Villa College, we have uh, a lot of online available facilities for lecturers, for personal development lecturers, for professional development, for visiting lecturers, or for part-time lecturers, or uh, full-time lecturers. They are able to grow themselves online anytime, anywhere. So this is an available facility for the lecturers. The students, managing the students, everything is managed online. There are, there are participations, there are class registrations, there are fees payments, and also tracking their attendance, including recording live class attendance is done online, for example. We do it here at Villa College online. Can record it again. Yeah, and the students can see the attendance, which class they, they were absent. This is really phenomenal because then the lecturers and the students and the institution, all of them have access to the entire system. It gives a, it reveals a lot of meaning. So this is really, really useful. So these advancements in the technology, it's provide the almost equal or maybe more than the skill set or more than the facilities of the traditional teaching in online teaching. Definitely, definitely. And, and for the lecturers also for their professional development, there are a lot of online communities available where they could exchange a lot of peer-reviewed information for lecturers to specifically uh, focus on their area of interest. Uh, these things are available for all the categories of education, not just for IT or engineering, everywhere. Okay. Okay.
Okay, thank you. Um, th thank you so much. And then I would like to ask about the industry side uh, from Mr. De Zosa. Uh, one of the report it says that by 2030, up to 85 million jobs of could be deep, uh, could be displaced by AI and automation. But at the same time, 97 million of new roles are going to be emerged. How do you see these advancements impacting the employability in the skill set record in the industry? And also, uh, even in your keynote presentation, also you mentioned about the digital strategies. So, what kind of strategies you believe it's crucial for the individuals and also institutions like us to adopt? Yeah. So. Uh, I think you, you referred to the possibly the McKinsey report uh, what was published in that data as well as the point I mentioned about the, the jobs is the you know students coming out of the school if the jobs what are they going to do is not there or the problem they are going to solve is not there like you know that's the extension of the possibly the same report what I'm saying. Now now the key factor uh, around the entire environment is that uh, with the jobs getting disappear there are new jobs coming in. So I took the example of this chat GPT. Uh, when the ChatGPT was created, one of the new jobs was created, what you call the prompt engineers. Yes. All right. So yeah. now, which is you need to train so many thousands of prompt engineers, that means you need to have skill set to prompt the ChatGPT to get the right answers. True. So one of the top most demanded jobs right now in the world is prompt engineers. No, do we produce prompt engineers in our, do we have a course, do we have a degree, I don't think so. Because this is all new, right, this is like one year ago, ChatGTP came into life. And how can you produce a graduate within this short term to become a prompt engineer? But world needs thousands of prompt engineers. So this is where, what we are heading in. Now she talks about uh, the, the Coursera, uh, Udemy, how these LMS is working in, right. Uh, and also how artificial intelligence taking whether now I want to study now say our traditional way is like you, know, you have a curriculum you study the entire curriculum you whether you know it or you does not know it still in material till you read it you study it right but again with the new tools AI which is uh, doctor was talking about that web.03 which is bringing in you basically go and answer few questions it will that ai will tell you what is your standard and it will tell you you are good in these areas but you are weak in these areas now you go and study in these areas and you go and do another set it will tell you now you are good you can go for exam again very simple right now again take one step back uh, i don't have a very deep understanding about the maldivian system but I believe Dr. you are working on a World Bank project on this digital uh, transformation as well. One thing is, which is we need to make the right policy. Now from a graduate point of view, you will have your criteria. You need to have so many number of hours, notional hours, etc. Right? So does this criteria means using AI tools and studying, does it get recognized? To my knowledge in Sri Lanka context, no. We are trying to change that. But how do you calculate it? these challenges will come. But now these kids will do these tools and they will study it. And if it is not being recognized, again they will drop it because you need the degree at the end of the day. So now it's important like you know discussions like this need to push the administration to get these policy changes in and how this transformation will happen. Now as an example, if you want so many maths teachers, can you produce math teachers within next one year, two years? No. So simple way of solving that problem as she was saying, you use a chatbot, chatbot will teach your maths, you can make thousands of chatbots taking care of their maths, but much faster than creating maths teachers, maths teachers yes. yep. so that's the way we should be thinking. Now as example, I will take a very simple example, all of you use these smart boards right. Now, when you're using the smart boards, does it have the capability of tracking kids are not focusing? Not really. You spend thousands of dollars and do it. But you need to make sure you get that smart board with the right <laughs> toolkit. Which is you need to think that intelligent is being building. When the question is answering that kids should be captured in. 
So this is, I mean, we are talking about AI on a real deep sense, but this is fundamental AI. So when you're looking at, when you're doing investment point of view also, that tools has to be invested in the right way. Now we're talking about the LMSs, the Udemy and Khan Academy, all that, right? So that gives you that flexibility and students will be able to use it and identify it. That's why these tools are getting very popular across the world. So possibly you may have your own LMSs within your universities, etc. Like you know, you have your MIS, your databases, student attendance to your behavior pattern to everything. So using AI tools in these LMSs, what you do locally, you can actually do wonders. You can do all things. You can match map the trends. What even economic goals can be mapped using these tools. That's the beauty of technology. That's what like, you know, which is the, we were talking, we were talking about the technology, the connectivity coming in and how that is getting moved. I believe Walt is also one of the best connected places which is so many cables landing uh, yes. while passing mall deals, which is the tools like uh, web.03 or what doctor was talking about. And you have a lot of capability on AI, etc. coming in. If you blend it, also key thing is like, you know, one thing is you have to have the right policies, right tools from a technology point of view. If you doesn't have these two, you may have the best of everything, you will not achieve the goals. So this is, decision making is so crucial on that. Okay, thank you so much. And then you talk about whether the smart boards are capturing whether the students are attending or not. Uh, but one interesting thing is uh, in the recent Tesla car, Tesla car is doing it, whether the driver is looking at the road or not. And if the driver is not looking at the road, means it automatically deactivates the autopilot and then it is giving a warning. Tesla car integrated, but I think smart board also have to integrate. Okay. So moving on, um, um, it's, um, let's also talk about the uh, policies and also some of the gaps. And uh, according to the UNESCO recent report, it says that to provide the connectivity or to maintain the connectivity, it costs 1 billion USD per day. So the resources, even though if you want the resources, even though if you want to provide the connectivity, we have challenges in some countries, all the countries are not same, all the um, institutions are not same. We have a lot of challenges in incorporating those technologies and all. Um, I'm very curious to hear from Dr. Bahid on what do you see as a primary challenge and the barriers obstructing the effective implementation of technology in education and what is the innovative solution for that? Uh, I think that's true, uh, not, not global, uh, but in the context of more resource, so the connectivity issue is a, uh, a huge issue. 80% uh, of the uh, users who are using learning management systems, who are using learning management systems, I said, like, uh, I mean, they are, they are not using the LMS. Yeah. The uh, learning management systems have been underutilized. So, I mean, before I just uh, answer your question, I think uh, we have uh, infrastructure. We have almost all the higher education They have the LMS. They have the the hardware, software, uh, and other plugins as well. But this has been underutilized. The research shows this has been underutilized by the instructors as well as the students. Talking about one of the main challenge is the connectivity issue, connectivity, and it's costly for them. Okay, so it's a global issue in the context of modules. I mean, it's more severe, I think. Okay, because uh, like uh, the data shows that uh, the communication authority modules data shows that only 15 islands, okay, out, out of nearly 400 islands, uh, the uh, fiber has been connected. It's only 15 islands. But then maybe like uh, uh, there'll be an audience that says a disbelief that no, 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 we are having broadband fiber optic connection every home, isn't it? Uh, that's not true because these, most of the islands are connected through microwave. 15 islands with the fiber, fiber. But within the island, we have fiber optic network. Within the island, we have. So that's where they call actually every home has been connected with fiber connection, isn't it? So it's a huge challenge. The challenge is not only the cost, the speed as well. So, uh, and since I'm, I'm uh, working on this uh, digital modules project, we are uh, funding for the communication authority of modules, okay, to make policies and also revisiting the regulations currently they are having to uh, reduce the cost of connection, okay, internet connect, uh, uh, as well as the 
uh, quality of service. Okay, so I think at the policy level we need to uh, uh, make uh, certifications and we have some strategies in overcoming these challenges. Uh, that, that is a, a huge challenge. And again, uh, uh, the even though you have a connectivity or high speed, isn't it? Uh, the digital literacy is also something because we are telling with the education technology we are promoting lifelong learning. Isn't it? So that means like not everyone will be digital literate, isn't it? So we have like maybe 98 or 19 percent literate, but digital literacy is something else. Isn't it? So we, we don't have that. So that has to be addressed as well. So that's uh, another challenge that we are having. So I think uh, uh, the infrastructure investment has to be there and then uh, uh, technology partners like Huawei, Microsoft and uh, other partners okay, can be coming in and then at the policy level and then we should have a national strategy to, yeah, and also regulation and policies to overcome these issues. And uh, I believe the higher education institutions should be given some incentives okay, for their internet connection. Uh, right now, uh, at the commercial rate, they are charging, the ISPs are charging at the commercial rate. Some education, I think the schools, they have a special rate, but the higher education institutions, they are actually paying at the commercial rate. This has to be addressed because if you are promoting the education and technology and also online learning, and if you want to reach more people, isn't it, and also to get the benefit out of this vast, isn't it, uh, advanced technology, then of course that we need to uh, address all this at the policy level. Okay, thank you so much. And you uh, touched some of the challenges like this connectivity and the cost involves and then and we are running out of time almost we need to uh, um, closing uh, going to the closing of this panel discussion. So in short, I just want your closing remark from everyone. Um, let me start from Naushad from here. Right, yes. Uh, I'll just comment on what Wahid, Wahid, Dr. Wahid said a little bit about um, uh, the challenges. So I think one of the important things to realize is in order for you to, in order to utilize uh, Education 2.0 or the technology, integrating it into a university or a school system, this is a lot of cost. Uh, if you really want to use artificial intelligence and provide personal learn, personalized learning to students and provide resources for lecturers, set up LMS and all, all this is cost. So mainly the associated barrier is how much can you afford to do it. So this is one of the costs which is uh, really the modern institutions have to take into account. So we, we may not find in every institution an LMS. You may not find in all, every single institution, uh, even from K through 12 institutions, just for kindergarten to grade 12, even for schools, you may not find enough resources because of the cost. Right? So this is mainly one of the biggest costs there, in, in addition to having digital divide or digital literacy. Right? So uh, I think uh, in order for us to have a proper use of internet technology, in our education system, we need to have a lot of awareness, a lot of um, uh, planning, as well as investment at national level. Uh, plus, as he said, a lot of policy policy planning as well. All of them have to come together to afford this, to make sure that all these institutions are on the same page. At the same time, people are aware of what is happening. Yeah, thank you. So we have discussed about um, the education and the transformation in education and shaping the education. Um, in, in terms of uh, employability and from the industry side, your closing remarks, sir. Yeah, I think uh, uh, the little bit I heard from this as well as the bit of exposure I had gone in Maldives altogether and what Dr. White was talking about. The digital Maldives plan is getting built and they are addressing certain areas with the telecommunication, with the communication authority, etc. I think we are on the right direction, which is I can say. Uh, now, uh, the point is like, you know, I have been part of many of such discussions in different parts of the world the question comes in okay investment costs right so this is a decision we need to take very consciously on prioritizing now the point i made versus what happened to kodak they found the, the digital camera in 1975 but they never took it to the market they never prioritized now in this case also that's the same situation we are in now from a investment point of view that's something you can't postpone in my opinion the key is unless we invest this is your investment for the future if you postpone it you are postponing your future you need to get that investment on the right time otherwise you'll be out of the market the key is that policies has to be done 
and your investment decisions has to be done on a policy point of view and in my view if you postpone it you are in great danger and the other commitment possibly i can give uh, to as Maldives and also the policy makers here that from a Huawei point of view we have been working in 170 plus countries on similar strategies which is we can bring you the best of the things out of that and also I've been myself being part of the Sri Lanka digital economy strategy which is again working with the World Bank uh, which is we have built a six pillar strategy altogether that definitely we can share uh, those learnings as a neighboring country what we have done and where we can work together as a team to make sure that digital Maldives is succeed which is one of the integral part of that is education need to be transformed and the right decisions have to be made in the right time. Thank you sir. Thank you. Uh, Miho, um, as a closing remark, how do you see the future of technology in terms of personalized learning and the data driven technology? Um, uh, the future of um, technology and education in terms of data and analytics it looks very, very promising. But I also want to highlight something other than um, just data and analytics that we, I personally want all of us to think about when we build on these systems. Like we need, we, we need to make sure that nobody is left behind. Recently I attended a forum and there were some uh, people with special needs and they were telling us that lots of the platforms that have been launched recently, they don't have the feature for disabled people to use it online. So I want to make sure that when we come up with these new systems for the education sector, we need to make sure that nobody is left behind, that everybody can use the system, whether they are specially able or whether they're just a normal person. Another thing I want to highlight in terms of data, um, Mr. Witte highlighted that we love all that computer science and engineering courses has a lot of lot less women when compared to those who are pursuing nursing, accounting, business management. So what I want to highlight here is using all this data, we need to make sure that our marketing is really great so that people understand what is out there for them when they embark on a journey on in a career path in technology. Even the girls, they need to understand that this really is a really great field to be in. As a woman, you can even work from home. There are lots of opportunities out there. There are a lot of new career paths as AI and machine learning and data analytics come on board. There are a lot of things that you can explore. And I want to see maybe in a couple of years, if I ever come to Villa College, I want to see a lot of girls embarking on a journey to learn computer science and to see more girls pursuing computer science degrees and masters in Willa College itself. So these are things that we need to make sure that, that even in the education sector that people know what is out there and we also need to make sure that nobody is left behind. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you. you. And I hope that we can see the contribution from the associations like Women in Tech Maldives yes, as well in that. Um, finally, uh, Dr. Wahid, um, we have talked about a lot of challenges and um, how we can navigate them to ensure the equitable access to the inclusive learning environment as a closing remark from you. I think uh, I think uh, we need to uh, take this uh, as an ecosystem. Ecosystem of technologies, just not an individual technology. Uh, the, the education technology is within this ecosystem of technologies. When we take the learning, manage, learning management system as a focal technology, it surrounds with all other applications. There are different applications, hardware, infrastructure, connectivity. All this, if we can take as an ecosystem, then we need to address all the aspects of this ecosystem. I, not isolating a single one. And then if it's one factor is not working, is it, it hinders the contribut contribution to the entire ecosystem, the others will be affected. So it's just like a, no, I mean, a natural ecosystem, isn't it? That's how it works. And, and, and then we need to 
train instructors and the lecturers how to use these education technologies. We can invest, if we have money, we can invest on that. And then, as I said earlier, actually, the main concern is like, it's everywhere. In starting from 2000, year 2000, now it's been like 2020, the last 20 years, uh, the research has shown that there are, I mean, many people who have done uh, for their PhD research, okay, on this area, shows that it's been underutilized. It's been underutilized. So we need to educate people. We need to educate the students. We need to educate the lecturers and instructors. It's not like, I mean, we are uh, in the forefront of technology, just having a smartphone, isn't it? How many of us use the 100% of our smartphone? It's been underutilized, isn't it? The, uh, and also, uh, it's not like the investment is too costly. Like, for example, for education institutions, Google Workspace is free, isn't it? Microsoft Office 365 is free. But how many of us are using that? Isn't it? Even without having a customized learning management system like Moodle, you can use Teams as LMS. You can use Teams as LMS. So, I mean, uh, this is how we look at, I mean, this uh, as like opportunities. opportunities yeah. Training the instructors and also educating uh, uh, the, the students as well as understanding this as an ecosystem, then you would be in a better position to get the best out of this. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you all panel members and then we are about to close the panel discussion. But before closing, I would like to take a few questions. We have limited time so we can take maximum of two questions from audience side. Any questions from audience? That's what. Very interesting panel discussion, really we have got many ideas. Uh, my question to the panel members is like uh, our syllabus got framed very long back, right? But the current trends were, were not introduced in our syllabus. So like uh, online platforms like um, uh, Khan Academy or Udemy are doing very well. So how we can incorporate to the syllabus or how we can make it like a compulsory to the students to learn? It, from where the change should, should be happening. Okay. Anyone from the I'll start. Thank uh, you. I, I think if you start integrating a lot of uh, resources, firstly, which are online uh, as resources for students to refer to or to study or to motivate them for self learning, this will speed up the coverage of curriculum and also make sure that they actually have the comprehension of whatever they have learned. One of the traditional a way of learning is we memorize a lot of things, right? We do a lot of memorization of a lot of uh, things in the in the content. This is because the focus is on preparing for the final exam, preparing for the standardized test. So it is still there in many cases, but still we have to prepare them by motivating them to learn, self-learn in a specific way by providing the resources. We provide them the resources. The online places where they can use, for example, if it is engineering, you have uh, augmented reality platforms which can allow students to practice a few things with very less cost. You don't always have the hardware, you don't always have the systems to practice those skill set for mechanical engineering students, for engineering students who are taking electrical engineering, a lot of augmented reality platforms, virtual reality platforms are available. For IT students, for medical students, they have, uh, medical students have especially a lot of uh, established platforms. So I think integrating those things will allow students to be more motivated, more interested, more engaged. The main idea is engagement. Bring more engagement from students. I think that is some contribution. Okay. Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll add a quick point. Um, now, quick point. majority of the kids who are in, are in focus of getting through the exam. So generally, if somebody comes for an interview to me, I'll ask one question. Tell me a something else you have done apart from your core project. 99% of the kids say no. They have done everything to get through the exam. From like this, I'm not quite sure from a Maldi point of view, but change in the curriculum, etc. is a steep path. Because you have a regulator who look after that and telling them to change it versus you have a 8 year, 10 year cycle between, between that will be a steep path. 
but how do you overcome that which is you can bring different cultures like how do you do courses like entrepreneurship how do you do or you create your incubation center in your place how do you create kids to think like you know rather than going and working for somebody you create organization by yourself give jobs for 10 people that's the way you'll be to overcome that challenge unless if you keep pushing it will be pushing that system forever and you are losing a lot of time okay thank you do we have any more questions yeah 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 so um i think first of all we need to do our research among the students and to find out what they want actually mm -hmm. then only we can deliver what they want after analyzing the data that we get from the students another idea that i have is using gamification and simulator trains like you can introduce some kind of games where they are motivated and they get leaderboards like badges and all these kind of things where it will be displayed among their student profiles so these things motivate students to actually start learning and learning self learning and all these kind of things so i think this is also another perspective of how we can use this technology okay, okay. thank you so much and uh, we are almost come to the end of the panel discussion and uh, today's panel discussion in education 2.0 the tech transformation journey we explore into the dynamic intersection of technology and education with insightful from the industry leaders academic professional education technology specialist and also from the data scientist so as we conclude this enlightening discussion it is evident that technology is transforming the education in an unprecedented way offering immense opportunity for innovations collaboration and personalized learning experience as a moderator of this session i would like to thank our esteemed panelists for your time and valuable contributions and insightful discussions throughout this session uh, um, let's continue to harness the power of technology to shape the future of education and empower the learning worldwide Thank you all for joining with us and thank you for listening with us. Thank you. Thank you.